Hi, I'm Susan Dixon. I'm the current president of the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California. I looked at the event by list and I realized that there are quite a few people who don't know much about our organization. We started in 1975 and we've been having monthly meetings during the school year, um, all of that time until the pandemic, but now we do Zoom. So from the beginning, our, uh, we were an educational organization and our mission was to discover and research the Chinese and Chinese Americans in the United States. We wanted to record that history and we wanted to make it known. So tonight we're having a program that's really to the heart of our mission. We had a vision 10 years ago and our speakers are going to tell us all about it and how, how it happened. You know, it succeeded beyond our wildest dreams. And I'm going to introduce uh, charter member Eugene Moy, who continues to be active on our board. And he's part of the story, but he's going to be introducing our tonight's speaker, Eugene Moy. Thank you, Susan, and welcome everyone. Uh, welcome friends. I, I, one day I will be looking forward to seeing you all in person, but uh, for now, uh, this is just as good because now I'm, I'm seeing friends from across the country who I wouldn't normally see if we were all in one room in LA. Uh, tonight we have a, another great program and presentation for you. Uh, it's very much in keeping with our mission, and that is to share our history. Uh, we have, a, as Susan mentioned, we started uh, in 1975. We've had this mission of, of uh, providing content and information for our uh, public and for school curriculums. Some of us have been actively working uh, in the education area. Susan's a retired teacher. And what we want to do is to try and further the awareness of the things that the history and the environment and the uh, contributions of our Chinese American pioneers uh, in our American history. So let me launch right into our, our program here today. Uh, we have a couple of very uh, knowledgeable speakers. Yan Yan Chan is a uh, a ranger at Yosemite National Park. She has been uh, there for a few years, uh, but along the way, she's really uh, initiated some new projects that uh, she will share with you, and she'll share some of the discoveries that. Uh, she's encountered along the way. Yale is, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Yan Yan is a graduate of Yale University. Uh, she double majored in history and environmental studies, uh, which made her very qualified for the uh, work that she was going to be in, involved in. Uh, but then after that, she uh, became a graduate associate at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, teaching Asian studies and uh, Mandarin or picking it up along the way. Uh, she's also been a, uh, a wilderness first responder, something I happened to, to <laughs> run across. You know, I, I, Yan Yan, I probably, we haven't even talked about it, but uh, it's nice to know that when she's leading a hike that we have a first responder who is uh, on the trail with us. Uh, but she's also, uh, she also has a writing certificate uh, in nonfiction. Yeah, so she's very qualified to be doing the kind of work that she has been doing, which is researching and sharing and, and uh, talking about the history of Yosemite. So what I will do is uh, I would like to uh, welcome Yan Yan Chan, and uh, she has a, a short presentation for you, and uh, we're glad to see you. Yan Yan. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Let me share my screen to play this video. So everything looks fine, right? Great. 
Great. Thank you, Jean, for introducing me and uncovering things about me, probably from the website. <laughs> I don't know. But um, it's is such an honor and pleasure to talk with everybody who is on this Zoom um, talk. And I wanted to wish everybody a happy Lunar New Year. And this is a, a really short presentation um, that is sort of the history behind how I started this research in Yosemite, which led to the pilgrimage. And this is the 10th year that the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California has worked with the National Park Service, as well as um, other groups that have been really instrumental in helping as well. So um, I'm really excited to share a little bit about this history. I'm not gonna go in depth because I don't have the time to, but I'll offer some resources you can find where you can learn more about it online. Um, I have a few articles that I wrote as well as a video, a seven and a half minute video. So if you wanna learn more about this history, you can find that online. So to start off, um, this is a photograph from one of our annual pilgrimages. And for this project, this uh, Yosemite Chinese history exhibit, it really was the success because of all the people, the experts, the supporters and advocates, people that really came up and showed up and helped with reviewing the history as well as um, really helping to think about what we really want to say in our exhibit. So I wanted to start off with that. But the story behind this research really, I think, started with the seed that was planted, this curiosity of learning more about the Chinese when I first heard about the Chinese who worked in Yosemite. And a lot of luck, a lot of good timing, and a lot of persistence. I've been in the park, as Jean said, for a long time. And I think the length of time it takes to get things moving um, was in my favor because we need that time for things to build and eventually led to our partnership with the Historical Society, Jack Shu, who was really instrumental in making this pilgrimage happen, planning that idea and getting everything going, as well as um, some really key people in the Park Service and the Yosemite Conservancy who helped to fund as well as support the park in this project. So I'm going to go back to in college. When I was in college, I was actually an intern in this really remote area of Yosemite. It's no longer remote, but at the time in the 1990s when I was there, it was considered the more remote area of Yosemite. It's an hour and a half drive from Yosemite Valley, and it's a subalpine region called Tuolumne Meadows. It's really well known for this really large continuous meadow the Tuolumne River, which is one of the two major watersheds in Yosemite National Park, which flows right by Tuolumne Meadows. And this incredibly glacially carved sculpted landscape of domes, granite domes, and lakes. When I was there in college, I learned from my supervisor that the road that runs right by Tuolumne Meadows that leads people to this beautiful spot from Yosemite Valley um, was built by Chinese workers. So this is a fun photo of my college, um, of me in college and my, my colleagues. It's not the formal photo of all of us, but on the far right, the bottom row is Ginger Burley, who I really give credit to telling me about the Chinese who worked on building the original Tioga Road. A little bit later, I came back to Yosemite and I actually worked in Wawona, where we have our pilgrimage as well. And I worked for the education branch in the National Park Service. And I learned that there was a Chinese laundry building right next to the historic um, Pioneer History Center, which is now going to be called the History Center. And at the time, it wasn't being used as a laundry, but it was just being used as a storage shed. So no one really entered it. It was sort of locked up at all times, and it was almost forgotten. And then I came back to Yosemite as an outdoor educator. And this is really what got the ball rolling in terms of my research. So one of my dearest friends in Yosemite is Pete Devine. He is well known as this long-term naturalist who's been in the park for maybe 40 years. He just retired and left the park this last year. But he was the education director for Yosemite Institute. And I worked as an instructor for the Yosemite Institute, leading um, school groups on five-day programs. And he became the education director of the Yosemite Association 
and they have these outdoor adventure programs. And he asked if I could lead one talking about the history of the Chinese. And so that really was the impetus for me to dig deep into the research because I was going to give an all day hike on the original Wawona Road. And those photos with the snow covered landscape are photos from that original Wawona Road in the winter when I hiked it with people. On the bottom, you can see a historic photo of um, the original Wawona Road with a stage wagon on it. And that road was constructed in the winter of 1874 to the spring of 1875. So during the winter months, about four months of construction, Chinese workers were hired to build this road that led from the southern end of Yosemite in Wawona to Yosemite Valley. The other really important step that happened is as a result of those outdoor adventures, which I led three years in a row for Yosemite Association members, is that I wrote an article for the members magazine. And that became the basis of a video that was made with Yosemite's videographer, Kristen Ramsey. So Kristen and I worked together to produce this video in 2011. And that is a really quick summary of some of the highlights in this article that I wrote for this magazine. So if you haven't really gotten too much in information or history of the Yosemite, um, Yosemite Chinese history, you could look for this video online. You can do a quick Google search and type Yosemite Chinese history and this video will pop up. So that gives you a, a, a really quick summary in seven and a half minutes of the Chinese history in Yosemite. As a result of that video and um, other programs I was giving in the park, as well as being invited to museums and other things to give talks, Jack Shu contacted me the following year in 2012. And that is when he came up with the idea of having these annual pilgrimages where we can bring people to learn more about this history of the Chinese in Yosemite. And as an optional part of it, not part of the official pilgrimage, we would go to Sing Peak, which is named for a Chinese chef named Tai Sing. And I talk about him in that seven and a half minute video. So during the pilgrimages, which I will not go very in depth into, because I think Jack will talk about this as well. Um, we gathered together based in Wawona in the southern end of the park, but we would explore different parts of the park. For example, Yosemite Valley, the top left photo, We'd also go to Tolly Meadows some years, which was a long drive for everybody that was participating because it was an hour drive to the valley and then another hour and a half to Tolly Meadows. So I really applaud everyone who came up to Tolly Meadows on that long drive. But there we would explore parts of the old wagon road, the original Tioga Road. And we usually would explore one day in Wawona near the History Center, as well as potentially the Sequoia Groves, so the giant Mariposa Grove giant sequoias. The photo on the top right is actually as during a pilgrimage exploring the old Wawona Road from the, the valley. So those are some of the things that we do. And one year, I think it was 2016, we had a tour of the Chinese Laundry Building, the interior of it. And that's where we saw all the different objects that was being stored in this historic building, the Chinese Laundry Building. So this Chinese laundry building was servicing the Wabona Hotel, which is not very far. It's just a short few minutes from this building. And it was built in 1917 to replace an earlier Chinese laundry building um, located, I think, really close by to this current laundry building. So this was a great way to learn about the history through the pilgrimages. And then the second optional part, which is um, for people that would like to go on a backpacking trip to Sing Peak, you can see Sing Peak on the top left. That's a 10,552 foot peak named for this chef, this incredible US Geological Survey backcountry chef, Tai Sing. And um, we've been doing this since, let's see, 2013 was the first year. So this will be our 10th year in 2022. And that led to this ribbon cutting. So we um, had our official opening of the Chinese Laundry exhibit on October 1st, 2021. And it was really through the support of so many people in this community, the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California, 
we had experts like Su Fan Chung, who I think will be giving a talk a little bit later this spring, and um, local experts, Tom Bopp, who is a Wawona history expert, who also helped with this, and Eugene Moy and Susan Dixon and everybody involved really um, helped to make this exhibit happen. So inside the exhibit, um, we have established the initial exhibit. It is not the full exhibit yet. We had initial funding mainly to restore the building. There was a lot of work to restore this building so that it is um, available for us to have as an exhibit. And then a little bit of funding for some exhibit displays. So currently we have 18 panels. This is on the left, two of the panels. Um, but there are 18 panels talking about the history of the Chinese contributions in Yosemite. We have an old stove. I couldn't find a photograph of it anywhere on my computer and a few um, heavy irons, but I'm gonna get into a little bit more of the details of what we're trying to do in this next phase. But this is some of the, these are some of the panels that we have. I'm just showing a few of them. Um, we have an introduction of this Chinese laundry and how it was built in 1917. It talks a little bit about the history of what brought many of the Chinese here. There were Chinese here before the gold rush, but a huge wave came in around 1848 and 1849 during the gold rush. We also have a couple panels on the Chinese and their work on some of the major roads in Yosemite. There isn't very much written about who was working on the roads and there are actually discrepancies in how many people were working on the roads. Um, for example, the Great Sierra Wagon Road, which is now today's Tioga Road, there are different references to different numbers, but approximately we think um, we have the numbers down as 250 Chinese workers and 90 European American workers and 100 additional Chinese working to blast the rocks through some really difficult sections. One of my favorite photos is that one on the right side where I have a close up of it later on. It shows the rock work that was needed to build a road along the side of Tenaya Lake. Tenaya Lake is quite a large, long, high elevation lake. And they built this road right along the side of it where the granite rock comes right down to the lake. So the Chinese were working to blast part of the granite and build a basic roadbed right along um, Tenaya Lake. Because that original stage wagon road became widened, when we now have this more wide road for modern day traffic, a lot of that rock work is completely covered by today's road. So you can't see that rock work anymore, but it's still there as the base layer. There's also a couple panels on the Chinese chefs who um, were really important in all the hotels. Pretty much they were the main chefs, the bakers, and they were also the laundry and hotel help in hotels throughout Yosemite, in Yosemite Valley, as well as Bologna and in the surrounding regions. And we highlight a couple of these famous well-known Chinese chefs. For example, on the right, Ayu, who was the head chef at the Bologna Hotel. He worked there for 47 years. Alui in the middle was the baker originally and then became the head chef when Ayu was older and was still working in the kitchen, but took a step back so he wouldn't be in charge of handling all the different orders. There were so many people that came to the Wong Hotel to eat there during um, the time he was working there. And there was also some pictures on the left of this US geological chef named Tai Sing. You can see a photograph on the bottom where he's cooking for this incredibly important in National Park Service history group of men. These men went on these trips and these trips were instrumental in the formation of the National Park Service in 1916. So there were two trips that Tai Sing cooked for in 1915 and 1916 in the backcountry. And within a year and one month of the first trip, the National Park Service was formed. And the second trip was just getting out of the backcountry when they heard the news that we formed the National Park Service. And these people that were on it continued to support the idea, continued to lobby Congress, continued to spread the word that national parks are really important. And so that's how we have 
that support, the initial support for the beginning of the National Park Service in 1916. And Tai was incredibly instrumental. Uh, the writings of these people document how um, incredible his cooking was. And he was just as important as every single one of those people at the dining table. There's also um, two panels on the history of the Chinese in Yosemite, as well as some really key important historical events, as well as laws. So we talk about a lot of the discrimination and the racism and the things that the Chinese in America had to face. And I think it's really important. We are gonna have activities, hopefully to engage the public to really understand what it was like for Chinese that came to this country and all the things that they did in the park as well as some of the key things they did in America. And to, at the exhibit, I just wanted to acknowledge um, it's really through the contributions of Franklin and Sandra Yi, who were the initial donors to make this exhibit happen. And we have funding from some other donors this year, the Fongs. And if anyone you know wants to learn more about what we're gonna be doing, I'm gonna talk about this next step, our next phase in the exhibit. And hopefully um, you can be involved with helping make this exhibit um, happen. <laughs> so there are still things that I'm uncovering. And if you hear of things that you think would be really interesting for the exhibit, um, please get in touch with me. I have my email at the end of this presentation. I'm going to wrap up soon because I want to give Jack some time to talk about the Cone Ridge, but I have received emails and photographs and leads for other photographs that I would love to incorporate into the exhibit. For example, this is, these are ones that I wanted to get in, but we didn't have space. But the one on the left was sent to me from Jim Lippman, and he said, I think it was his father who took these photographs in 1914 in Yosemite Valley um, during the 4th of July parade. And these Chinese that I'm guessing were workers in Yosemite Valley um, participated in this July 4th parade and they're holding this giant Chinese lantern. The Chinese also were really instrumental in a lot of the Sierra Club outings. So they cooked for a lot of these um, Sierra Club trips. There are things that I want to add to the exhibit that's not there yet, but um, we probably need to figure out ways to make replicas or find donated items that we can add. Um, we have these objects in our Yosemite Museum. So the bottom right photo is actually this tin can that inside has this porcelain container that contains the red ink for a chop or a Chinese seal. We also have so many records of the Chinese who worked in many of the hotels, you could see, for example, the payroll of Hotel Sentinel in July of 1911, and the first person's name, Mao, the chef, and how much he was paid, as well as Singh, the baker, and all these other people. So we have records of these people, but what I haven't found are first-hand accounts of what their life was like. I don't, haven't found letters or writings directly from them, and those are things that really make that story richer. There are second-hand accounts, though, of these people from a lot of the hotel workers, the managers, who talk about the Chinese worked working for them in the hotel. And the other thing that I'm gonna do this spring is I wanna visit Sun Sun Wo, which I visited a few times. And for some reason, when I looked at this online last night, I saw, I saw a different Sun Sun Wo. It looks like it's open for business now. It was actually for years, whenever I passed through this town of Culture Hill, right outside Yosemite, Sun San Wo was boarded up and looked almost identical to that black and white photo um, of Sun San Wo, but it looks like it might be open for visitors now. But Sun San Wo is another thing that I'd like to highlight in the exhibit, some stories, because they were critical in supplying workers on a lot of the road projects. And they also supplied food and other items to, um, to Yosemite, to the hotels throughout Yosemite. So that's another really great way to add to the story today. Like I mentioned, this is one of my favorite photos in the exhibit. This shows that rock work um, by the Chinese who were incredible in the way that they could build these roads in an incredibly short amount of time, just like when they built the railroad. Um, this road that was built, the Tioga Road, was completed in 130 working days. 
And I think if they hadn't worked so quickly because of their speed and efficiency and the way they did it, um, if they hadn't built that quickly, we might not have a road that crosses the Sierra right by Tuolumne Meadows because the following year after this road was finished, it was actually built for this old mining town. The mining town closed for business and so there would be no more funds for this road. And so it's pretty incredible the history that we have in the park. This is actually the mine where the road ends and then a few years later it went down to the other side of the mountain. So it's the highest Trans-Sierra crossing of the Sierra Nevada range at 10,000 feet above sea level. And Su Fan Chung, Dr. Su Fan Chung told me about Cordwood Ridge, which is just beyond Bennettville. If you take a walk um, beyond this mine, you'll find piles and piles of these abandoned logs that was originally probably going to be used for the mine or to build homes and log cabins. But um, as I mentioned, the mining town closed suddenly and there are like tons of these rocks, um, these logs sitting there, probably 140 years old sitting there. Finally, there's more and more research coming out about Tai Singh, this incredible US geological chef. And there are more photographs that I've found, but a historical society researcher at San Benito County wrote an article about Tai Singh. He died in an accident in San Benito County. And through her research in their records, she discovered more about his life. And so we hopefully can add more to the exhibit about Tai Singh. This is a picture of him in 1915. So the last thing I wanted to mention in a few minutes is where we're at with the exhibit. This is a, a diagram, it's not exact, but this is sort of our thoughts about how the exhibit will be displayed. Um, we have those 18 panels that you see. There's those different zones where the panels are. So there's an introduction zone, a video, Chinese laundry panel, roads and railroad workers, Tai Singh and chefs, and then future across generations. And we wanna incorporate many activities for families to learn about the Chinese history in Yosemite. What we didn't get to when we had the, road, the exhibit opening are a few displays that our exhibit designer is working on. So we'd like to build um, an interactive display with a laundry, um, with some laundry items, working with actual stoves that we have, and then a, a working kitchen display. So he's actually looking for objects, and that's what I'd love to share with you is if you have any objects or know people that have objects that you'd be willing to donate, we are looking for objects for our, our exhibit. And um, there are many different things that we're looking for. And there's probably things that is not on the list that you might just let me know about because maybe it's something that we do want to include in our interactive display. Um, there is a list that I just received today of some of those objects that exhibit designer would love to find. So um, that's one thing that we're working on. We only have a little bit of time right now to look for them. And hopefully maybe next year we might have more time to do other things, but this is what we're doing currently to build on the current exhibit is to look for things like steamer baskets and um, things for uh, telling about the story about the laundry, for example. The other thing that um, we're working on is hopefully we'd love to have a volunteer or an intern work at the laundry building and interpret or talk about the displays and interact with the public. And I spoke with the supervisor, Adam Ramsey, and it looks like we have the ability to house one person for part of the, the seasons where from spring to fall, this exhibit will be open to the public. So the next steps for the exhibit is we're searching for objects so we can actually make the exhibit more um, interactive. And we are hoping to find volunteers. So if you have any of those ideas that you'd love to share, you can send me an email as well as Adam Ramsey. And um, I think Eugene, you mentioned that you're welcome, you're welcoming emails as well, but I, I'll let you just talk about that if you want to receive emails from people. But yeah, you can contact me at yenyen underscore chan at nps.gov and the Wawona supervisor, Adam underscore Ramsey at nps.gov. 
So I just wanted to end it there. So, Eugene? And fantastic. Uh, you know, I, I can uh, vouch for all of this being a, an amazing experience, the opportunity to uh, go up and see mining town like Bennettville or to see some of the uh, amazing sites in, in Yosemite and to understand that Chinese, early Chinese were involved in helping develop a lot of this. We're gonna talk a little bit more about uh, what we, we can do as an organization, but I'd like to uh, first uh, then introduce our, our next speaker, uh, Jack Chu, to talk a little bit about uh, his motivation and his interest in really furthering this Yosemite and Chinese story. Jack has been uh, with, uh, had been with the uh, California State Parks for a few years, and he'll maybe share a little bit of that too, um, with the California Department of Parks and Recreation. He's been a uh, park superintendent for much, most of that time. Um, he's developed uh, programs that serve youth and families. Uh, he's an educator, basically, and, um, and he's also been recognized as an urban hero uh, in uh, various uh, park circles. So he's really a, a recognized authority on, on some of these subjects. He's been a consultant on diversity strategies for uh, organizations and for community development programs. Um, he's also um, organized uh, some training or conducted training programs on diversity and uh, outdoor education. So we basically are, are working with someone who really is deeply committed to the field of uh, environmental education and also uh, history. Uh, his commitment to our Chinese American community uh, runs deep, but he also is uh, very much involved in his own community of La Mesa down in the San Diego County area. He ran for city council and won, and now he's busier than ever. And he thought he was retired as a uh, park superintendent. And now he has uh, a full plate. But uh, in, uh, in uh, listening to Jack, you understand that his deep commitment to um, sharing and increasing the awareness of the history, the contributions of Chinese Americans is, uh, is uh, an, ex an example of his uh, long uh, commitment to, to sharing our history. Anyway, I'll let Jack do the talking uh, since I'm not uh, uh, really uh, going to be able to, to, uh, to uh, to uh, share it as well as he can. And uh, I'll let uh, Jack uh, share, a little, uh, sh share his uh, a PowerPoint with you uh, for a few minutes. And then afterwards we'll have a Q&A. Um, I encourage uh, everyone to send your, submit your questions in the chat. And then uh, when, when Jack is through, we'll, we'll be able to have a, a little bit of a discussion and respond to some of your questions. Uh, Jack? Thank you, Eugene. Uh, thanks for the nice introduction. Um, uh, prior to becoming a council member, I um, was a community uh, advocate and often uh, spoke in front of uh, city councils and commissions and boards, and I was usually limited to three minutes. Uh, but once I got elected, I wasn't given that limit anymore. So if Excuse me if I if I go a little bit longer, but I do have a short uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation. Prior before I or well, as we start here, I want to uh, make sure I give some uh, photo credits to Bach uh, Zhang and Alan Deer, who are actually with us uh, tonight. Uh, but some of their photos are going to be used, um, and uh, uh, later I'll start mentioning a few other names. But I want to really uh, recognize the organizations and individuals that are making this uh, pilgrimage such a, such a success. Let's go to the next slide. Let's just talk about the National Park Service uh, for a moment. Um, you know, established over 100 years ago. Uh, but in its mission, I think I want to point out that it has cultural resources as well as natural history and natural resources. 
and that the National Park Service was formed to, uh, for, for education, for enjoyment, inspiration, and for future generations. So I think those are important aspects um, of its mission. And within the, the federal government, this is the one agency, the one department service that uh, can really serve this uh, purpose for lots of people. It has lots of park units and a lot of resources. So let's keep that in mind as we go forward. This is the, our, our national organization that can deal with legacy and help us in, in many ways in this education process. Let's go to the next slide. So um, between four to five million people, I think their high mark was five million people visit Yosemite each year. That's how many people visit the park. So if you can think of just as reaching a small percentage of them, 5%. If we can reach 5 to 10% of that population, how many people that would be in terms of um, uh, learning about a wider uh, aspects of American history? Uh, the, currently, the typical message that a park uh, visitor gets, they get the great natural history, and that's instant as they drive in. Even in, in poor weather, they'll get that. They'll get half dome. They'll get much of that when they get to Yosemite. Uh, but beyond that, they'll learn about um, Ansel Adams, John Muir. They'll learn about a lot of other characters, uh, but how we can fold in the story of the Chinese and other groups that were involved in Yosemite, the lesser known stories, uh, more than just the Native Americans indigenous populations, uh, that, uh, that the Buffalo soldiers worked in Yosemite. How do we weave that in so that we have a diverse uh, um, story narrative about the park. Of course, I also want to talk about why does that matter? Um, why does it matter that we be inclusive and that we show the full story of uh, this country's history? Uh, and as we get into uh, social issues, I, I think it's very apparent that, that that is important, that people know that uh, Chinese are not uh, immigrants that got off the boat yesterday, that we were here um, for a long period of time. And we were instrumental, not just as uh, laborers, uh, but as skilled workers that brought in all kinds of um, um, technological and advanced uh, systems, as well as uh, work ethics and, and other kinds of um, uh, will willpower um, ideas uh, and faith in, in other um, uh, thinking that really led to a lot of the growth in this country. Let's go to the next slide. And this idea of the um, pilgrimage grew about uh, 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago, really because I saw that uh, video that Yan Yan was, uh, was in and, and she mentioned. Uh, and why a pilgrimage? Um, it's just been in my experience that uh, government organizations um, take a long time to change. Uh, and sometimes that's a good thing. We don't want them to change too quickly. Uh, so a pilgrimage is something that we do over and over and over. And how many times do you have to do it? Well, my mother used to tell me for me to make something, uh, one of my dishes that I like to eat a lot, I better make it 10 times before I can uh, make it well enough and that uh, I don't have to worry about going through recipe every, every time. So um, I thought the pilgrimage need to take place about 10 times. And um, who will attend? Well, initially, those who are vitally interested. Uh, so the Historical Society and its um, members, people that are interested, of course, attended the pilgrimage. Um, and what will they learn and experience? Well, one thing they learn and experience in the picture on the right is not to pick up artifacts and take them home. <laughs> We're at a historic site. Yeah, you know, of course, warned us um, that's a federal offense. So let's not. Uh, for our own historic sites. That happens to be a historic site in Yosemite Valley that uh, we visited during one of their pilgrimages. If we go to the next slide. Um, at the pilgrimage, we have food. Um, we have some of the best food, some of the, really some of the best dumplings uh, made in the San Francisco Bay Area. One of uh, uh, the, the winners of uh, dumplings, dumpling making was at our pilgrimage. And it's participatory and fun. And you know that's a critical element. Food is a critical element in, in uh, gathering. So we certainly have that uh, as part of the pilgrimage. We've worked that in. 
we can go to the next slide. And we visited historic sites, and Yayan talked about them already. But to actually see a embankment and the rocks that are still in place after over 100, 120, 30 years, um, those rocks are still in place without any mortar. Uh, that was very impressive. Um, and, and actually walking there uh, in this beautiful environment was great. Let's go to the next slide. Um, after three or four years, um, the pilgrimage became an anticipated event. People were looking forward to it. And that was an important aspect of um, making things happen and, and having an influence into the institution, the institution of the National Park Service. The staff at the Park Service starting to start to recognize this was going to be a, an event that they can look forward to each year of, of a, a group of Chinese interested in his, the park's history coming over and over and over. Let's go to the next slide. Um, that was the developed part of the pilgrimage. There's another uh, thing that I got into mainly because I was interested in backpacking and I thought we should pay special um, commemoration, special attention to this guy, uh, Tai Sing, the chef. And it happens to be on a beautiful peak. And I thought that's something I wanna go up and, and hike. And, I had, and a number of my friends and new friends decided to uh, join with me. Let's go to the next slide. Um, you know, I like to say at times that uh, the National Park Service was created uh, in part because of Tai Sing, this Chinese guy. Um, and because, you know, he helped uh, with this uh, Matthew Mountain Party to um, really get interest and, and really have the final push uh, to make the National Park Service be formed. And now that I'm in politics, I see how important that was in terms of having journalists and writers on those uh, on this um, Math and Mountain Party. And they were there because of Tai Sing. So in many ways, Tai Sing is responsible for the National Park Service. Let's go to the next slide. Um, it's a mountain that's beautiful and the views from it are great. That's the, the one of the views in our lower left-hand uh, uh, picture is of uh, the minarets from uh, uh, Tai from, from Sing Peak or on the way to Sing Peak. This is really, um, uh, for me, a real pleasure, uh, a fun part. This is what I love to do is uh, go backpacking in the Sierras and it's to a, a great peak. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so I'm gonna show you some of the, uh, well, actually all nine photos of each year that we've uh, been to the peak. And you can see we've had small groups, large groups, um, but a, a very, uh, great group of folks that have uh, joined me in going up to Sing Peak. Let's go to the next slide. And these are another four years, the more recent four years uh, of people that have gone. So there are a lot of repeaters there. As you can see, many faces you'll see more than once uh, as um, we do this pilgrimage to Sing Peak. Let's go to the next slide. And this is last year's group. Um, a great group um, that came uh, two different groups that hiked up there. Um, and the one group uh, actually had a, a hard time um, re just reaching the to chain lakes um, because we decided to take a, a long a different route that took uh, took a lot out of us. Let's go to the next slide. So what do the uh, people who go up Sing Peak get? Um, they get a lot of, I think, uh, mem memories, great memories. Um, and they get to be a part of this process of instilling and reminding people about Sing Peak and who Tai Sing is. Uh, and I think the most of my reward is to all of us individuals who have made it up there, but hopefully we also help uh, articles and journalists uh, write about um, Tai Sing and the entire pilgrimage. Um, and to that, I also wanna give some credit to journalists like uh, Vanessa Yu, from um, the Bay Area, Allison uh, Singh G. Um, these are journalists that wrote some great articles and that lots of people, hundreds and thousands of people um, get to um, learn more about the history of Chinese in Yosemite. Let's go to the next slide. 
um, the pilgrimage help uh, promote and stop having a state um, uh, resolution passed to again recognize the contributions of Chinese in Yosemite. Uh, this is um, by uh, Assemblyman uh, Frank Bigelow, uh, thanks to the help with, of uh, Ron Southern Gill from uh, NPCA, one of our partners. They've been really helpful in um, supporting this pilgrimage. Let's go to the next slide. Um, and then mention uh, the, uh, the most recent um, thing that happened is this Chinese laundry building. And that happened with a lot of folks uh, helping the Yosemite Conservancy, of course, the contributions of Frank and Sanju Wang Li, he and um, a lot of staff at, at the national parks. Uh, and I think that's uh, really a, a great effort by a lot of people involved with uh, the park itself and all of our partners. Let's go to the next slide. The narrative of the Chinese in Yosemite and throughout the West uh, can be changed in many ways. And we used a lot, we got a lot of help. And I, I looked at these books to draw information from. These two books, many of you are already familiar with. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, another great book that came out recently, even though it was about the Transcontinental Railroad, uh, reading um, Professor uh, Gordon Chang's book taught me a lot about um, the immigrants, where they came from, and many of the things that they, they had to go through and the skills and knowledge that these early immigrants had. Let's go to the next slide. And another person in the book that many of you are already very familiar with um, helped really get to some details. And again, things I, I just didn't know about um, really came through from these uh, books, uh, from the academic research that was done and then uh, made it available to four of us to share and learn from. Let's go to the next uh, slide. Um, so the question really is for the historical society as we move forward, um, do you really want to change the narrative? How much more do we want to ch change it? Um, this group photo at the end here is um, a group that stayed after the opening of the laundry facility in this last October, stayed with uh, in a group discussion did surveys and we compiled that information, gave it to the National Park Service so that uh, they'd have some input as to uh, suggested changes and future work that could be done at the laundry facility. It's a never ending process of providing input uh, to the National Park, Park Service and helping them go through this uh, change to bring these um, his stories forward as well as helping the National Park Service tell the story to a much larger audience. So that's the end of my uh, presentation. And um, Eugene, you want to facilitate maybe a short uh, question and answer period? Thank you, Jack. Yeah, I'm sorry, a little delay here getting my audio back. But uh, yeah, this is really inspiring because I think both Yan Yan and Jack have been involved in changing the narrative. That was a, a, a good closing statement. And that's really one reason why it excites us, you know, the general membership of the Chinese Historical Society in really being involved because here's a chance to really experience history, to walk the trails where uh, Chinese walked and the trails that Chinese built, the roads that Chinese built, to see the buildings, the places that uh, Chinese worked, uh, whether it's doing laundry or uh, growing vegetables or cooking meals for the uh, visitors to, to Yosemite. So, you know, it's been, this is our 10th year, and this is just really something that continues to excite us because there's just so many more discoveries that we're coming upon. So uh, what maybe before, I, I don't see too many uh, questions in the chat. So uh, please do, everyone, uh, please do um, send submit your questions via the chat. 
but maybe I'll I'll just sort of uh, start off uh, for uh, go back to Yan Yan for a moment. Uh, uh, I think you you commented on what some of the needs are for developing and completing the exhibits. Uh, I just uh, learned from uh, one of our board members that because the Chinese Historical Society does have a historic uh, artifact collection from the High Lung Laundry in Santa Barbara, a historic laundry, that we may actually have some of the items that could go into a laundry exhibit. And it would be very appropriate because it comes from a historic Chinese laundry. So, uh, but there are other uh, opportunities for um, uh, improving the uh, the narrative, the presentations. And, and so Yan Yan, do you have any uh, further comments on, on what else we could be doing in the uh, immediate future? I think right now, um, immediate project, we we just have a, a budget and as well as um, the time frame to just add and really work with the exhibit designer on that laundry and chef cook, cook station exhibit. There are, you know, I'm always open if you have anything related to this exhibit that you think we could use in the future, um, please send me an email. I would love to add more stories, more personal stories, more experiential ways for people to learn about this history. Um, and that's something that I'm going to try and push for in the park. But right now we're just building on that objects right now is what we're focused on. And um, there is going to be a short two minute museum video that we're putting together that's going to highlight a couple objects so that we let people who can't come to the, the laundry building know that we have this exhibit. So that's something else that we're working on currently. Great. Uh, let me, uh, before uh, we go into other questions, I want to let everyone know that we have uh, planned already the next pilgrimage, and that will be this coming July, the last three days of July. Uh, which is uh, July 29th, 30th, and 31st, where we will have our, our traditional gathering. Now we call it traditional now because it's been, uh, uh, we, we've been doing this for a few years now. Uh, but we're going to have a gathering uh, in Wawona. Uh, the, uh, because the, the camping situation is a little bit uncertain, I think we'll likely just all be uh, housing ourselves in the um, in the uh, redwoods at Wawona or redwoods in Yosemite complex uh, which provides some very nice cabins uh, fully furnished and equipped with kitchens a place a comfortable place for us to to uh, have fellowship and enjoy ourselves at, at a, a basically a, a base from which to go on some of our little journeys, whether it's going to be a hike one day or a, um, a cookout, a, uh, a potluck where we get to share, as you saw in some of the photos, uh, some of the uh, joys of cooking out in the mountains. Um, and then that will be followed on August 1st, 2nd and 3rd for those who are interested in backpacking, it's a hike to Sing Peak. It's a few miles, uh, but it's uh, something that <laughs> Jack and <laughs> well, it's something that Jack and Yan Yan have have led groups. There have been uh, I, I saw in one of the photos there. There's a, a Gladys Wong, who uh, not a, a uh, large person, but she made it to the top and she, there she was uh, uh, shouting to the heavens. And, and Gladys, I, I see that you're in the audience today. Uh, so we, we do have our plans. Uh, some cabins have been rented already. Uh, please do check the Historical Society website, chssc.org uh, for more details on reservations as we get closer to the date. Um, let, we should let probably just... get to a few, few of the questions, uh, um, Eugene. And um, I, I think it's, I want to make 
want to let people know the backpacking trip is for experienced backpackers. So people who have uh, uh, backpacked before, have uh, backpacked uh, this coming season before they uh, try to go up uh, and are able to um, navigate not only a trail, but to do some rock scrambling. And um, uh, it's, it's important that people have that uh, ability to do that as well as the, the strength and have done so recently. Um, uh, otherwise, it's just not, uh, uh, it wouldn't be uh, good if anyone got hurt on uh, any of the pilgrimages. So uh, I think uh, I want to emphasize that. And to, to do the backpacking portion, uh, they should, um, uh, if they're interested, if you know someone who's interested, please contact me. Uh, we've pretty much um, gotten most of the permits from the two trailheads that uh, lead to the trails that eventually go up to Sing Peak. Um, uh, Yanya, you want to answer some of these questions? Uh, there was one about, do we know any of the descendants uh, of Chinese workers? Oh, I didn't see that question. That must be way up there. <laughs> um, do you know anything about the descendants of the Chinese workers? Uh, we do know about Tai Sing from um, when he passed away that he had a wife and two kids in Hong Kong. Um, we, we know that Ah Yu was single. So he was in his 90s living in Merced, but we don't know about his family in China, anything about them. Um, there are a lot of the Chinese that worked in the hotels Sounds like they were single. They didn't have their families here, but I'm assuming that there must be some ties to home that if we could find more information about that. So no, that we don't have anything yet. So something to still continue to look for other than Tai Sing right now. And there's some controversy about his last name may not be uh, uh, Tai Sing. So there's a yeah, lot of work. He had a travel visa, Li Win, Li Wim Dong, Li Wei. Lim Wee Don, I think yeah. is his so, other, other name. Uh, yeah, a lot of, lot of more work, a lot more work for historians and researchers. It's yeah, good. he could also be a Yi, Y-E-E. -E. So, uh, yeah, his I, brother was Yi. Right. So, so, yeah. So we, we, we don't know, you know this is, this is the, 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 the great fun that we have in really doing Chinese American history research is because our, our forebears, knew how to get around and uh, whether it's under one name or another, uh, you know, they managed uh, despite all of the challenges that they faced here. Uh, and in the future, will the Chinese laundry exhibits be online? Is there a, a plan to put some of that, to make some of that history available? Yeah, there is a little bit right now on our webpage, the www.nps.gov slash Y-O-S-E. That's something that I would love for us to work on. Um, we're doing step by step. We, as you might know, the Park Service has so much happening <laughs> with the visitation that um, I hope that we have a better online presence with the exhibit. We are putting together this really short educational video that will highlight a few things that the exhibit has. And then that's the first step and we'll hopefully add more um, online. Thanks for that question. Though. Yep. For, for those uh, who were not on the trek last year, uh, one thing that we had to um, uh, work around was the fact that Yosemite uh, required reservations to enter the gates. Uh, and in other words, reservations uh, in, uh, with accommodations in the park. So what we had to do was to show that we had a, a commitment to be in the park uh, in order to, to get through the gate. Um, not sure what will happen by July. Hopefully things will ease up a bit and it'd be easier for people to, to just drive in, but you know, we're, we're not quite certain. There's a lot of construction work underway. So the uh, uh, park is still try to manage the flow of visitors into the park. Um, let's see. Let's, this, oh, go ahead, Jack. Oh, I was gonna just mention uh, some people asked about the backpacking trip. I just put into the chat, my email address, jkshu52 at gmail.com. Um, so you can email me if you're interested in the backpacking trip um, uh, and I can explain uh, what the, the backpacking portion is like. Um, but 
you know, as we are finishing off the hour, I want to really emphasize um, the, the importance of the historical society and its work fulfilling its mission. Uh, I think it's important for not just Chinese Americans uh, throughout California and, and, and the country, but for all the people whose stories are not well told throughout our country and our history. It's, it's really important, for, I think, for our society. And for that, uh, to really um, move forward, um, this is Yosemite. Yosemite has all these untold stories, but we can't stop at Yosemite. Death Valley has stories. Um, Joshua Tree has stories. Uh, Redwoods have stories. All these places in the national parks, and then I haven't even talked about the state parks and county parks. All these places are have the duty of telling these stories. That's part of their mission. And we wanna make sure these stories are inclusive and have the best uh, effort to help our society, uh, our cultures uh, flourish. And I think that's to me, the important aspect of, of the, what the Historical Society is helping to do along with all of our partners with uh, National Parks and Conservation Association, in this case, the Yosemite Conservancy and all the volunteers and donors. It is a momentous uh, job, but it's so important as we face all kinds of issues uh, in our society today. And I think one of the, the great benefits of going out there and, and being immersed in our history and in the mountains is that you discover the whole context also. Uh, for example, last year, some folks followed uh, Paul Lee on a trip outside of the park um, going, uh, how far did they, everyone go, Jack, um, to uh, visit places uh, beyond Yosemite where Chinese uh, had walked? Did they get as far as, as, as Bodhi or? Anyway, you know, uh, some of us also went to fish camp just south of uh, Yosemite to see the location of a Chinese cookhouse. Uh, actually, not just the location, we actually saw and walked through this uh, cookhouse from the late 19th century that served basically a lumber camp or timber camp. So there's a, a lot more than just simply uh, uh, walking the, the trails within the town here, within the, the park. Um, there's a question here. Uh, what month might be the uh, might the exhibit be open? The, uh, I'm assuming this is the laundry exhibit. Uh, I think uh, it might be closed for the winter, but what when will it be open, Yinyan? So we get an influx of more seasonal staff, which um, helps us when we have visitations in the spring and summer and fall. Mid-April is the estimated time because I think we have staff coming in in early April. And I heard it will open through mid-October, so approximately mid-April to mid-October. Um, and again, there's a possibility for a volunteer position if anyone would like to either they know someone or if they're interested. <laughs> so you can get in touch with Adam Ramsey. Yeah, and they get, I think may have free space in the Wawona Estates as a living accommodations. Well, it looks like they might have a shared housing in the government housing, potentially. <laughs> I don't yeah. think they'll have a nice redwood cottage to themselves, though. I'm not sure exactly. Housing is very difficult to find in the park. Yeah. Uh, so uh, right now, I saw some questions about where will where can people stay uh, during the uh, pilgrimage or the trek. Uh, so let me clarify that. Uh, we we'll plan some hikes uh, in a, for those who are concerned about how much elevation or how much how difficult it will be i think that uh, there's usually a, a combination of light to moderate kinds of hikes that we we plan and uh, the the the, um, the backpack itself of course is for people who are fit and who are experienced uh, but most of the, the walks and hikes that are planned are really uh, for some of us who are maybe not quite as fit, but still it's a, it's a good little bit of exercise. You know, we all need to get in our steps anyway, right? And uh, up in the uh, uh, mountain air, 
you know, the elevation is a little bit higher, you know, from 4,000 feet, I believe, uh, in Wawona to a little bit higher at the uh, uh, Tuolumne Meadows. So uh, it requires a, a, us to, all of us actually, to uh, maybe encourages all of us to, to get out there and take our daily walks. And, uh, and this would be just a, an opportunity to see some of the wonders of nature and some of the wonders of human endeavor. So, um, by the way, I, I should mention that um, I see Ron Sundergill uh, on, in the audience and uh, who is with the National Parks Conservation Association, who has been a great supporter for our pilgrimage. And I uh, thank you, Ron, and your staff for really helping uh, over the past uh, 10 years now. Uh, I don't see any other questions. I see thanks to Yan Yan and Jack. Uh, let's see, where do people stay? Um, we'll explain that in at the Chinese Historical Society website, chssc.org. Uh, how can we sign up? Uh, I'm just looking, oh. And uh, we'll, as uh, Yan Yan mentioned, there's a uh, continuing research on, on Tai Sing's life history. And uh, we'll try to get some of that posted uh, as we uh, improve our website. Uh, what part of China was Tai Sing from? Well, he may be from Nevada. So you know, we, we don't exactly know. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, our Chinese American forebears were very uh, enterprising. You know, sometimes they may have been born in China. They may have been born in, uh, they may have been uh, immigrants into Canada or Mexico, and then ended up coming into the U.S. Uh, so the the journeys that people took is kind of like this journey up to the top of Sing Peak. That. that uh, it requires some effort, requires a little thinking and ingenuity, and uh, it's always a uh, always a, a great experience. So we hope that some of you can can join us in July and August for for Sing Peak. I think I have to wrap it up now because it's past eight, and some of us already have other things scheduled, but. Um, there's never enough time to, to share this history. The best way is to come to Yosemite in July and come join us on the trail, come see the laundry exhibit and uh, come share and break bread actually. You know, that's always the fun part is uh, sharing uh, and our stories, our histories and our common history. So, um, there's, there's I don't two see quick any more new questions. Jack, do you have any uh, final comments or yet? Well, yes, yeah, there's two quick questions. Uh, there, there's no relationship between the two historical societies, North and South, uh, part of uh, California, uh, no formal relationships. But of course, anyone who have many people from Northern California participate in the pilgrimage, they're welcome to, to do so. Um, and uh, the funding, uh, this is a part of the National Park Service uh, in terms of uh, the exhibits and, and many of the staff that's uh, going into the laundry exhibit. Uh, but um, in terms of the actual uh, uh, renovations at the laundry building, that was done largely due to a large donation from uh, Franklin and Sandra Wong He, he uh, that also paid for some of the interpretive uh, 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 exhibits that have gone in. Uh, so the, I know the Conservancy is con continuing to do that. The, they want to continue to do that. They're getting more donations because we have, we have ways to go. The History Center is going to have a lot of other exhibits, uh, uh, renovations as well. So we have a long ways to go in Wawona. Um, and there's the rest of the park. There's the, the rest of the valley and Tuolumne that all have uh, similar stories and, and could also use similar kinds of um, facilities to, to um, be to have a more inclusive uh, narrative uh, for the park. So a lot, lot more work to do, but we got a lot done in this last uh, 
past few years was were great. And you know, there's a lot of snow up there, so we hope to see some waterfalls, some good waterfalls this coming spring and summer. So I wanted, yeah, yeah, I wanted to add one thing. We usually can get camping for the pilgrimage as well. I think Wawona last year was under restoration, but it should be available. So that could be an option for our pilgrimage during yeah. the, the six days, the three days okay. in the park and then three days backpack the day before. Okay. Yeah. I, I think the reservations are still closed for the campground, so, but. Yeah, I'm in touch with them. It hasn't opened yet, but I'm pretty sure we can get it. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, I, I think all good things must come to an end. And uh, we really uh, appreciate Jack and Yan Yan sharing their knowledge and their enthusiasm for sharing this history of the Chinese in Yosemite. So like to, uh, we would like to uh, give, extend a, a, a Happy New Year greeting to everyone out there. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in July. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thanks.